Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So as recently as five years ago, when chemotherapy was really the only option that we had available for our patients, it was typically about a seven to 10 year survival for patients with CLL once they initiated therapy. And patients were usually succumbing to either having refractory CLL or to the toxicities of the chemotherapy that itself. The greatest concern and the greatest fears from our treatments really were the developments of either MDS and AML resulting from the chemotherapy damaging the bone marrow or from the, the chemotherapy itself inducing a more aggressive CLL either in terms of it becoming refractory or in terms of it transforming to a large cell lymphoma. So the biggest obstacles for enabling our patients to live normal life expectancies, if we could ever think in those terms, really were chemotherapy not working or chemotherapy damaging the cells of the body or the CLL cells until they just became too difficult to treat. So in essence, chemotherapy provides us with a no-win scenario because sooner or later, one of those two always will happen. With these new agents that we have, and be it obinutuzumab, ofatumumab, rituximab, and the anti-CD20 antibody therapies, or idelisib, ibrutinib, and venetoclax, we really have the potential to use agents that are extremely well tolerated, that are extremely effective, and the likelihood of developing resistance is extremely low. So what really is so remarkable about these changes in the past five years is the ability not only to avoid chemotherapy and its toxicities, but also to, in addition to avoiding the chemotherapy and its toxicities, but to get long-term effective control of the disease, and that since these are agents that patients can remain on safely, we can actually control the disease for long periods of time. It's my hope that we can one day make CLL just like high blood pressure, where people take a pill a day to control their hypertension and don't really worry about the long-term sequelae. And it's certainly possible with these new agents in CLL. The last several years have seen a remarkable series of developments in the treatment for CLL, including four FDA approvals. Two of perhaps the most exciting include the drugs abrutinib and adelalisib, which are inhibitors of what we call the B-cell receptor pathway. CLL, being a B-cell malignancy, is dependent on chronic activation of the B-cell receptor pathway for growth, proliferation, and survival. Interestingly, there are no activating somatic mutations in this pathway in CLL, but the pathway is chronically activated anyway. Now, the first of these inhibitors, abrutinib, targets a protein called BTK, or abrutin's tyrosine kinase, which signals just downstream of the B cell receptor in CLL cells and in B cells. In fact, BTK was recognized as an excellent target in B cell malignancies originally because there is a human disease in which individuals have mutations in the BTK protein and do not develop normal B cells, but are otherwise healthy. So this indicates that targeting the function of that protein can knock out B cells, but not otherwise harm the individual, which obviously would suggest a good drug target for cancers that arise from that type of cell. Now, abrutinib is a first-in-class oral covalent inhibitor of BTK. Because of this, it actually has a relatively short half-life in the blood, but can result in 24-hour target inhibition in patients. This has been demonstrated in the early studies with abrutinib. The initial approval for abrutinib was in relapsed refractory CLL, and this occurred based on a phase 1b2 study, which was not originally intended for registration. The study enrolled approximately 85 patients with a median of four prior therapies who were treated with single-agent oral abrutinib, 420 milligrams per day, which is the dose in CLL. And it was found that the patients had quite remarkable responses 
In fact, in recent further follow-up data from this study, the median progression-free survival has not been reached in the entire population at three years. Those patients with low-risk cytogenetic characteristics who do not have deletions of 11Q or 17P, in fact, have an 89% three-year progression-free survival. Those astonishing results led to the initial accelerated approval of abrutinib, and the full approval was given following the report of a randomized trial called Resonate. The Resonate trial enrolled relapsed CLL patients with a median of two to three prior therapies and randomized them between single-agent abrutinib and ofatumumab, which had approval in the relapse refractory setting. Abrutinib was found to significantly extend progression-free survival as well as overall survival in this trial and led to full approval of abrutinib. In addition, the category of CLL, which includes deletion of 17P, which affects the P53 gene, has actually very poor outcomes historically. In the early abrutinib studies, it was noted that responses even among 17P patients were quite good compared to other therapies that were available. Abrutinib therefore received an indication for both frontline and relapsed 17P deleted CLL based primarily on the Resonate data, which was not originally designed for that purpose. There is an ongoing phase two study designed for registration in 17P CLL, which was first reported in December 2014 at the American Society of Hematology meeting. But those data are still relatively immature with just one year follow up. Now, the second B cell receptor pathway inhibitor is called adelalisib. And adelalisib targets the PI3 kinase pathway, which is certainly well known amongst a variety of cancers. It's somewhat unique in its role in CLL, however, because one particular isoform of PI3 kinase, the delta isoform, has expression that's limited to hematopoietic cells and has a primary physiologic function in B cells, at least based on data from knockout mice. Therefore, targeting the PI3 kinase pathway in CLL as well as other B cell malignancies has really focused primarily on inhibition of the delta isoform which can allow the avoidance of certain toxicities that have been seen in PAN inhibitors, including, for example, hyperglycemia from effects on insulin secretion. The first in class molecule that inhibits delta specifically is adelalisib, which was studied originally in a phase one study that established the dose as 150 milligrams twice per day. Again, oral continuous therapy is how the drug has been given. Registration trials of three types were initiated, and the first has been reported with relatively mature follow-up and resulted in the approval of adelalisib with rituximab. That study was again done in relapsed refractory CLL patients who had significant comorbidities and had relapsed within 24 months of their most recent chemoimmunotherapy. As it turns out, approximately half that study population did have the very high-risk 17P deletion. And patients were randomized between adelalisib with rituximab or placebo with rituximab in the relapse setting. This study, similar to the Resonate trial for abrutinib, showed a marked progression-free as well as an overall survival benefit for the adelalisib plus rituximab group, leading to full approval of adelalisib for relapse refractory CLL. The important trial, which I think we should all watch, is the Pharmacyclics 1102 study, which treated patients over the age of 65 with CLL who were previously untreated but required treatment for their CLL. These patients were treated with ibrutinib at 420 milligrams daily as a single agent. The trial initially enrolled 31 patients, and with the exception of five patients who have come off study for either a Richter's transformation very early on in the study, or for toxicities, everyone remains on study and in remission on the ibrutinib. And while the median follow-up is still short at 40 months, my hope is, is that as time goes on, we will continue to see these patients remaining in remission and remaining without toxicities. And the other thing that I think is really important from this study as well from other studies is remaining on an agent like ibrutinib is not associated with any increased toxicities. So we're not making our patients immunosuppressed. 
just like we would with patients who were getting chemotherapy or other anti-CD20 antibody therapies long term. So ultimately, whether or not it involves the use of a targeted agent like idelisib or ibrutinib by itself or in combination with an anti-CD20 antibody, the hope is, is that we really can impact upon the longevity of CLL patients in a very positive way.